will join me in welcoming the Prime Minister to the stage to defend the motion of scientists.
but their skills in constructing messages, their skills yeah. in marketing different ideas and products, trump the ability of an individual, even if they had that money and capacity, to disseminate their ideas that they have. Well, what are the commercial incentives people have? They have an incentive to sexualize their products, to make them the most attractive they possibly can in a sexual sense, to draw people to them. They also have the most incentive to create an image that is likely to objectify. They want an image that, is, that somebody is going to link to purchasing their product. They want an image that is going to be most able to be captured and owned and associated with a product or a piece of property that, that person is willing to purchase. They're also most likely to make it the least personal as possible to increase the breadth and number of people that can be exposed to it. So to reduce sexuality to its most raw sexual norm, as opposed to incorporating all of the other subtle things that we associate with sexuality, as opposed to the real, the real imagery that goes with creating somebody who is naked or sexually suggestive in a particular image. So we think the capacity to build in the type of personal elements to sexuality that we think human beings generally like to expose sure. is limited by the very nature that you have a still image with no sound and no capacity to see that person moving or expressing other human emotions. We further think that there is a direct incentive to sexualize them more and to one up the next best, the next sexualized image. And that incentive further drives that commercial incentive away from it. We think that has three impacts. Firstly, and most prominently, it objectifies women. It says that their sexuality is a public commodity that can be controlled by commercial interests to be used to sell products. We think that is unacceptable. We think it creates negative body images that defines what is the sexual norms and what people should be forced to live up to. We think, finally, that the state has an interest in pushing back against this cavalier attitude to sex. The government should not allow those commercial incentives to undermine important norms. Individuals should be the ones that define the importance of sex and how they'll manifest it. The public sphere has, a, sphere has a huge cultural impact on popular culture and the way in which we perceive it, especially on young people, because they consume the most and they're most influenced by the media they have, because it makes up a higher proportion of their overall experience of the world compared to adults have, but they have a manifest of other influences upon them. So in their most formative years, when t children consume the most amount of, sec of, of television and of information in the public sphere, we think these harmful norms are damaging and the state should push back against it. Because the state should want people to take sex seriously and it should want to empower them to be able to construct those cultural norms free from commercial incentives to make them harmful. That's why this motion must stand.
fell down in this debate. My first point of substantive, which is also going to respond to a lot of Chris's material, is about what this motion or this proposal says about the way we deal with sexuality. Because what these guys want to do is remove it from public life. Interestingly, Chris started his speech by acknowledging that we are all influenced by the sexual manifestations that exist in public life. Ergo, by removing it, we think they remove a large portion of the way we construct our sexual identity. We think it's a problem in this debate. What does this proposal say about sexuality? It says that it is dangerous, something that needs to be repressed, something that is similar to illicit substances, Mr Speaker, and needs to be regulated to that extent. We're not really quite sure, in, in like utterly, what they wanted to talk about in regards to sexualised images. So I'm going to break these two things down. Firstly, if we're talking about sexualised ads, we think that what this says is that people are unduly influenced by sexuality, that they're somehow coerced by sexualised ads because they can't respond to them in a rational way, in the same way they would, would respond to any other sort of advertising. We think that's harmful when you say that people can't respond rationally to sexualisation. If we're talking about softcore porn being available in news agents, we think that that's problematic because, again, it suggests that people can't, like, by the existence of sexuality just being around them, that their own sense of their own sexuality and their own sexual identity are fundamentally confronted by that. We don't think that people's identities are as unstable as the opening opposition wanted to have you believe. But finally, what we heard from Chris on this issue is that, no, we need to limit this because you can totally express your sexuality in private. We think that that's wrong for a couple of reasons. Firstly, on the idea of religion, we think that people, we could, like, probably limit religious expression to the private sphere. But we don't do that for a number of reasons. Firstly, because when you limit expression of identity to the private sphere, it involves some sort of shame. It says that not everyone is happy with you doing that. Not everyone is happy with you expressing your sexuality in that way. We think that it is unfair to force that shame on people who just want to have some aspects of public life sexualized and express sexual identity in, for instance, their consumption or in their reading magazine. But secondly, we think that your, pub, like your public sexuality is very different to your private sexuality. That you can choose to have sexuality involved in your personality and your outward identity in a way that is very different to sexuality as it would manif manifest within your own intimate relationships. I'll take you down again. Isn't the problem that like people's perceptions of sexuality within dominant media could affect me even if that's not the way in which I want to perceive my own sexuality? So I'm not treated like an object in the bedroom because that's how a man sees me in public. Well, firstly, we don't think you're banning porn altogether, so I think you're going to have a fast stretch to prove that all porn is not going to continue to like demean women. But I'm going to talk now in my second point of substantive about why offence is not a legitimate way of regulating this. Given that I proved to you that there is some value in having sexuality in the public sphere, why isn't it enough that just some people, like Jen, are offended by this and we shouldn't regulate it on that basis? We think in a liberal society that you have to have a number of identities existing in public life. For instance, sexual libertines, like we're talking about in this debate may also oppose the public expression of religion. If I'm an atheist and people publicly proclaim their religion, we think to the same extent I could be offended by that. But the fact is, is that we don't regulate those things. We also don't regulate political views that may also be offensive. Why don't we do that? Firstly, because we don't force people to feel shameful about aspects of their public identity. Secondly, we don't think that we should tell people who are offended by these things that they have to be so offended that by the existence of countervailing views in society that their identity is fundamentally shaken to the core, that they can't respond to those identity challenges. That is to say that these guys would tell you that women can't get up and respond to the fact that some sorts of sexualization demean them, that women can't answer those challenges. We think that harms their own sense of identity when you say to them it's not stable enough that when someone just has a countervailing view, you can no longer attach that identity to yourself. Thirdly, we don't think that we limit those countervailing identity influences because to some extent we want the public sphere to allow for alternative conceptions of sexuality. So let's talk about teenagers from a very conservative family. We want those teenagers to have like challenging interpretations of people being able to be sexually liberalised in the public sphere. We think that's a very important function of the public sphere is that you can experience other forms of identity that you're not only just limited to your own identity 
because we think it is good for people to be able to challenge their sexual values, to explore their sexuality. And indeed, that conversation, when we do think your sexuality will be challenged, for instance, when you develop as a teenager, or when you just come across this material because you're not going to be able to totally insulate yourself. Like, it's not like just because it's isolated to double XX, triple XX, that you're never going to come across an internet site that has sexualization. We think that conversation is harder when the public sphere hasn't already shown you that there is some alternative. When you allow people to exist in a bubble, that makes those identity challenges harder for them. We think that this motion should fall, Mr Speaker, for the following reasons. Firstly, sexuality is important to people. It's important as a public manifestation of their identity. But even if it wasn't true that that was the case, we don't think that offence of this is good enough. People's identities are more stable. They can be challenged by the alternative conceptions that we would allow in this debate. That's why the motion should fall. Then she said, but creating a conception of shame associated with sex. This is not 
not about public displays of affection. It's not about the ability of two individuals to say that they love each other or kiss in a public place. It's not about the ability of individuals to then in a private sphere and feel normal about doing it. It's about what happens when corporations are involved as the dominant actors in the portrayal of that in a public sphere. We think that promotes incredibly problematic conceptions about sex, which are far, far worse than shame. Yes. Some of the most positive and, and progressive depictions of female sexuality come, for example, from niche artists who take new forms of, see, of female sexuality in arousal. Are they also bound, or are you only limiting this to advertising now? They are also bound, but we don't think we lose very much, because the reality is that the number of people who see sexualized images of a woman in a shoe ad are substantially higher than the number yeah, of women yeah. who go to feminist art galleries and view those images. If we have to lose those in order to lose the dominant problems that are causing the problems that those feminist artists are trying to deal with, we are very happy to make that sacrifice. Let's move on. Let's finally talk about the particular minorities and teens and individuals who might be particularly repressed that Elle wants to talk about. We say that there are two types of individuals that fall within that. Firstly, those who genuinely don't want to be exposed to those images, we think are substantially benefited by our side. But for those who are being forced into not exploring their sexuality by their parents or by their families, a culture of dominant display of sex dictated by corporations in their public sphere makes those families and those parents far more repressive than those individuals and makes it far less likely that they are able to interact with people who might give them positive views. But moreover, for those who do have repressed attitudes about sexuality, exposing them to the kind of images that are produced by corporations only gives them a false picture of what sexuality is like and is partially responsible for the way women are treated by those minorities when they do eventually go into sexual relationships and have those kind of relationships. We don't think that's a benefit on your side. Let's talk about that positive material. Let's talk about gender equality. I think the problem of gender equality is really genuinely hard to fix. We think it's infinitely more difficult to solve when you have a normalised view in society that women in particular are sexual commodities, that women are things that are used to sell products, and that viewing women as sexual is normal and that is normal in a public sphere. We think this does three things. Firstly, it sets standards of expected female behaviour in public interactions. It sets standards yes. of female dress. It sets standards of female attitudes towards other things. It sets an, an acceptance of sexualization that you demand from the women that you interact with. And women who don't want to fit into that have a much harder time doing well in the workplace. It's why you can link the length of a woman's skirt to the amount of money that she is earning in her job. We think that is incredibly problematic. But that is actively promoted by a society that views women as sexual objects, not just in private and in pornography, where people are purchasing that explicitly for a sexual means. But, and here's the real distinction. In public, where you are viewing that as something that is normalised by society and accepted by society and viewed as the standard of women in society. And that is the real distinction between porn and just generally sexualised images. That one is public and publicly recognised and publicly displayed and when you see it, you think that all women are more likely to be like that and should be like that. We think the second thing you do is you set a standard of accepted female behaviour in the private sphere. That when women go into relationships, they are viewed as more submissive and more likely to be viewed as a passive partner. We think those kind of problems are substantial. They are problems that need to be fixed. And more importantly, they are problems that can't be fixed. While the actors that set views of sexual norms in society are the corporations buying the ad sponsors. We're happy with PDAs. We're not happy with those ads. We're happy with promise. Mr. Speaker, the proposition bench's conception of sexuality is utterly perverse in its lack of perversity. <laughs> what it suggests is that sexuality in public should be combined to PDAs. That is to say, you can only express your sexuality in public if you're in a relationship. What they say is that porn is somehow not a part of one's sexual identity, although apparently a Prime Minister it basically constitutes it. What they tell us is that it's fine to have good wholesome sexuality in public, it just can't arouse you. That is just bizarre, Babylon. So, moving on to some reputation before I bring more substantive material in this debate. Let's take the case that Madeline introduced to the debate that was apparently so easy for the prop side to win. Ads made by men for men that demonise women. 
We would say that these are some of the very ads that feminist groups have launched intelligent and provocative campaigns to take down around the world. And we believe in the capacity of women to use their agency to fight against conceptions of sexuality for men. In the exact same way they fought against the state's repression of their sexuality the last time the state decided to repress their sexuality. We believe in the capacity of women. We don't believe the response to objectification is to objectify women in discourse as well as through image. We believe that's incredibly damaging. We thought that some of the things that she said as well about sexuality were totally untrue. Because why might it be the case that this certain type of douchebag advert, apparently made by lots of shoe companies, exists? <laughs> we believe there are also ads for women. I think women and gay men in this room might remember those awesome absolute ads with the trans women shirtless. Yeah, that was hot, and we enjoyed watching that too. But gentrification doesn't go one way. And by the assumption that projected categories in this debate are children and women, something I find offensive in the first place, is damaging because men engage in objectification as well, and, sh and, and so women engage in objectification as well, and should be encouraged to. And we think that's something valuable and new in public discourse, something that's only come around in the last 30 years. It's something we don't want to retard by removing women's arousal from public space as well. And that's such a new concept historically. We think that's incredibly important. The, oh, I didn't actually start my time. So, and the other thing that was right, I was so angry. The other thing that they said is that porn wasn't part of your identity. We think that what you do while you're masturbating is an important part of your size, that your sexual identity. Because you might be doing it alone, but it influences the identity that you then interact with in the public sphere. We think that is incredibly important. We don't believe that just sex that you have with, with, with um, your partner is the sex that's important to you. Because part of your sexual identity is formed in response to death. It has to exist beforehand and be fully developed in that sense as well. We don't necessarily think that corporate value, the, the corporate filtering these values is different. I might be intimidated by people in public having PDAs, but why is it so different when their value of that expression of love is then photographed and sold back to them? We think that was so weird. Because it's not just sex that corporations sell to us, it's things like gender, like conceptions of race, like conceptions of class. And we have, I expect and allow people to respond to those conceptions, especially when they have to have a ring of truth in them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be selling the product in the first place. I now want to be honest with my substantive material first. So your argument is that the solution to the objectification of women is to also objectify men? <coughs> yes, because we believe that objectification isn't necessarily bad. The viewing of someone's body as something that you want to fuck, that is the expression of lust or arousal, is not necessarily thing we want to suppress, because this is an alarm. But you can suppress that just because at any direction within the body is placing warm feelings within that body, we don't prioritize wholesomeness over filthiness. We think both are powerful expressions of humanity, which is why they belong in humanity before. And what we believe is obviously, obviously, men have overstepped the mark in the way they portray women. Obviously, there has been demeaning portrayals. We're not going to deny that. But the removal of all forms of arousal isn't the best response to that, is what I said in my reputation. Because what you're saying is, is you can find sexuality to, you know, shop selling porn, which has traditionally been a male context for the consumption of sexuality. We think that is very damaging. As I've said, you said that women can't respond to this. You objectify them again. And it's also true that just advertisements, or just this set standards for women, often women set standards for women, modelling set standards for women, the consumption of all kinds of products, <coughs> the existence of beauty and, 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 and that's value in society set standards for women. We expect, and, and, and women expect, to, to respond to those standards themselves by running campaigns, by dealing with that, and, 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 and really mistaking the argument about why they need to be valued. That's an important <coughs> challenge to feminists, an important part of liberalism. The reason why I hope that worshippers don't worship in private, even though I'm not religious, is why concept of redefend the idea that society should be a secular space, that atheism is the right thing. We think that is an important part of the liberal pluralist sphere that is so vital. But also, we think sexuality is likely to get worse under the side of the house. Because now, it's not something that's expressed in the mainstream, it's generic universalizing language of sexuality, but something that's very private, that appeals to a market of smut only. Excluding that opposite conception of sexuality is quite dangerous. We also think that you're going to lead to the men that like those shoe lads, who feel expressly repressed, especially in backlash. They're not even going to make arguments to them now. They're not even going to tell them why identification is bad. You're just going to stop them looking at the porn in the first place. Closing. Right, but in the status quo, you're providing a particular dominant narrative to people as to how they ought to understand their sexuality. How does having that preconceived before you ever interact with another human being a good thing? Because we believe that the rise of all forms of alternative sexualities, including on the online, which is a part of this debate, and, 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 and draw online pornography, is an example of the way that we have resisted dominant forms of sexual representation in the past. But we don't think that sexuality, as I've said, is the only way that standards are set. We think that gender ads, even if everyone's fully clothed, 
can send messages about gender, which can form our gender identity before we've had time to consider that, in the same way that we expect them at that point to engage with it. Malcolm said on this that, well, sexuality is different because it's irrational. It's too much of our sense. Because ar arousal might be extra rational, but it might have impacts on your rational identity in the future. It might make it become a component of your identity. And just because of the sign that you consume it, like we don't think that people watch magazines that contain gender messages, like as they're deconstructing, as they're post-structuralists, but comes by their identity as well. And we believe they have a right to do that. So the other really reason we think we need to have this, that we need to have, say, misogyny in the public sphere, is to chart society's project, progress on this issue. Madeline was right that this is a big problem, that it has been a big problem historically. And one of the most powerful ways that we can look at how society is improving is by allowing, for instance, female objectification of men to grow in society, female empowering representations of themselves to grow in society. We also need to send a damaging message about children in particular, that their sexuality is removed. I know myself, when I was discovering my sexual identity, the presence of arousing male images in public were quite useful because I want to come from doing that in private. And we think that's a powerful way in which children discover their sexual identity. Because while parents don't like to admit it, children do have a sexuality. Children do experience arousal. It's incredibly confusing for them. And it's extra confronting when you tell them that you feel shame associated with that. What we stand for in this debate is not a rejection of the idea that some sexuality is damaging or some sexuality is offensive, but that reasonable adults and members of the public sphere have a responsibility to protect themselves and contribute to that sexual discourse, not to censor it. We were very proud to oppose it. Because that closes the opening half of this debate, so I'd now like to call upon the Member of Government to extend the other case. Ladies and gentlemen, on proposition today, we are not against sexuality, but we think it's important that individuals have the chance to fully learn their own sexuality through experience and experimentation with partners who if they have a comparatively more equal bargaining relationship with. And they do when the kinds of media influences saturate the, the ways in which they understand their sexuality, as they do in the status quo. So Steph and I are going to make that case for you today and talk about two things. First of all, exactly how the dominant media paradigm today does create an objectification and perversion of sexuality for individuals. Second of all, how when you get this experiential, experiential the, and I'll find that word at some point in the speech, learn sexuality, that's a much better way for people to be able to approach sex and gender relations. And there are also going to be two weapons, so let's dive right into this case. First of all, perversion of sexuality. What we recognise in proposition today is how arousing images saturate society. We're not just talking about, you know, the real, really, really obvious, you know, we're standing there in a bikini, um, next to a car kind of images they do. We're talking about all sorts of things no. you know, you, which try to portray to people's sense of arousal in all senses. And these things do permeate far, far deeper than opposition would have you believe, which means that people come into contact with them much more frequently than, again, they would have you believe. So, and particularly, we see this through advertising, and we see particularly it draws upon female sexuality as the dominant mechanism for media of self And there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, as first, first props went out, we just think there are more men at the top within businesses when they're actually pushing these kinds of things, and they have an entrenched position from the patriarchy to push their messages. Second of all, there's a perception that sex sells, and a perception that particularly female sexuality, and in particular perversion, tits out, big bum, those sorts of things, those things sell. And the problem is that cops women as well as men, unlike what opposition think, which means that even women will buy your products when you end up putting these kinds of sexuality out there in, in the image. And because it's kind of right. propensity, this is how they use. But even when we look to the ways in which men men men's sexuality is portrayed, for instance, in the old spice advert, where you had the man who went from sort of forest to jacuzzi, <laughs> was this like that sort of dominant macho image, right? Which people are forced in particular binaries of how they should approach right. their own sexuality. And so that is problematic because it creates a particular message which is hard for anyone else to begin to opt out of were they to want to portray a different kind of sexuality because it's not going to sell as well. It hasn't been proven to sell in a dominant market. <coughs> and so that's why you get, for instance, adults like women who are stretched out across cars. Are they riding the orgasm or is their neck just broken on that car? Right? <laughs> that's the problem, right? These things look have a relation of violence tied up within that. And even when it's not at that end of the spectrum, ladies and gentlemen, even when it's more moderate, right, we think it becomes norm to sell the female body in these kinds of ways. And that is harmful because it creates a form of objectification which right. leads people to view others as objects, which is likely to feed into their ideas of sex in general, right? The point at which you view someone else's sexual objectification tied up with your own, it's hard to do that as independent and therefore respect them in 
and sexual relations, ladies and gentlemen. So that's a problematic. But moreover, what we think is that, as this is the crux of the debate, really, ladies and gentlemen, that arousal is learnt, right? So op come up and they want to say, look, you have a stable identity, and whenever you see you can challenge it. That might well be the case with porn, ladies and gentlemen, because you know you're buying into a product which is primarily built for arousal. It's not so if I'm going to just like look at an advert and clicking through like a ladies mag, right? And I'm seeing things like Tic Tacs, sort of being sort of like having these, these sort of subtle messages which begin to shape the ways in which I view myself. That's not a choice, and you're not in the paradigm to be able to actually challenge that ever, which means you're more likely to get those dominant messages feeding into the way in which you view yourself, right? It means that's why we say women being predominantly subservient within the bedroom. And let's be clear, we're not saying that you wouldn't otherwise be subservient were you to have an equal state in how you learnt it. The point is in the status quo, we can when never know when people are fully freely choosing that as a way in which to interact with their sexuality and understand their partners. And we think that they assume that's incredibly harmful, precisely because of, particularly for women, precisely because the subservient can be incredibly upsetting, right? The point at which women have learned, some women have learned arousal, through which they can only get off when their partner has to shout at them, you're a slut or a whore. Those are things which, even if they are aroused by a time of women, can have incredibly long-lasting detriments to their self-esteem, precisely yeah. because of the meaning of those words. Thank you. So let's look second of all at why our model is yeah. better. Because we think when you remove this massive cultural influence, which by the way we don't think feminists can just change, precisely because everyone has been co-opted by this narrative, and even if you can get some people to buy into it, you can't you can't get all women to go to mass a mass campaign on the entirety of the way in which the society is structured. Unfortunately, outside of debating, feminism isn't exactly a nice word for most women that don't necessarily yeah. want to be tarnished with that, ladies and gentlemen. So we think what you do when you remove this is you remove a mass of stunting to people's ability to fully enjoy their sexual Jen. sex. Yes, sir. How does the state measure when people have learned their sexual identity if they remove okay, most now, of the sexual information Okay, now, we can never fully measure what we're telling you, what we do there is a comparatively better place. Why is that? First of all, when you put it into the fine domains which people have to seek out to access, we know they have chosen to do that, and that means they are more likely to have a critical eye to what they're actually having their identity shaped off. Second of all, we say there will be far less of the kinds of pernicious influences within the dominant public, right? Which means that you're much less likely to get these levels of objectification should be being shaped. We just don't think it's natural that women would necessarily be the ones who have all the attention put on them in like sexual relations in terms of how we phrase sex in the public discourse, were they not these kinds of influences. So what happens instead? We think people learn their sexuality and their sexual arousal through experimentation yeah. with those who they are attracted to. And this is quite obvious because we had sex before we had media, ladies and gentlemen. Right? <laughs> people were able to be attracted to each other and have relations with other people. But why is it actually better? First of all, we think that sex is more fulfilling for all parties. We think it's a freer kind of sex because you don't have these dominant cultural influences shaping the way in which you think you must have to interact with your partner in order for you to get off and them to get off. Which means you're much more likely to do things which are first to be just more experimental, maybe you'll find other things which you wouldn't have otherwise stumbled upon. And that's true for both men and for women, ladies and gentlemen, right? Men may not want to be trapped within this sort of dominant paradigm. Maybe they want to be the subs in some relationships. We think that's the kind of thing which conceptions can break down over time, which you don't get when otherwise you're always going to be deviant to that message. Second of all, it destigmatizes practices which are currently perceived to be deviant sexual practices because they don't fall within that dominant form in which society understands what sexuality is. Because to opt out of that code of law and to express a different preference to either in public or more likely to your partner, you're more likely to be faced with ridicule when there's a dominant understanding of sexuality which the media continuously reinforces through all sides. When you remove that, that is the point at which people are more able to express, say, like, oh, maybe can you suck my toes, or maybe other things I'm not going to reveal any of my other things. <laughs> 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 That's the point at which they can do that, ladies and gentlemen, because they're not scared of people laughing at them. They're not very nice guys. <laughs> so, and that's the point at which you then get outlets being more likely to provide those kinds of services for them in the adult industry as well. We think, ladies and gentlemen, you get a more healthy form of sexuality on our side of the house, we propose.
Mr. Speaker, where is the love? We want to talk to you about selling love, why selling romance can be very beneficial to people, why it actually allows them to discover themselves in a meaningful way, which is just banging some hose head off a headboard and calling her a slut really loudly, because we don't think that's always beneficial as the only way to discover your sexuality. Um, we want to talk about access to sexuality and why we believe this is a negative proposition. Thirdly, we want to talk about how uh, we believe it actually goes against positive discussion of sexuality and the consequences arising from that it, it, uh, in, in society in general. And finally, we want to talk about the modification of self-perception that's brought about by this proposition. Getting right into it, we're will be integrated. The idea of selling love and why we think this can be beneficial. We say firstly that people always learn things. Like in the modern world, about their sexuality through the media. They've accepted that on their proposition uh, by saying, for example, things like advertising have an effect, right? And we, we would also add to this, as we said, of information, things like art, any sort, of me any sort of media interaction that we have. However, we have two options here today. We can go along with a prop where you're left with a situation where the only way to access your sexuality through the media is in a way that's devoid of feeling, or whether it's devoid of emotion, or interact with any kind of meaningful personal or emotional interaction with another person. It's something that's purely sexual, something that's purely urge of flesh, and there's nothing more to it than that. We think that's massively problematic. We say that on our side of the house, we give you a much, a much rosier alternative. We give you an option to actually have that interaction, have that feeling, see people interacting with each other in something like a film about, it, about people's relationships, which can definitely be expected to arouse viewers, which can definitely have this effect on those individuals who choose to consume it. But furthermore, under our side, we get to see often what happens in the aftermath, because it's not purely a bedroom scene, ladies and gentlemen. No, it's so much more than that. We say that, for example, we see that, for example, like that falling into bed with someone can either result in you never wanting to talk to them again, or very different, or very different circumstances. And I wouldn't say the previous thing from personal experience. Um, <laughs> leading, um, leading to very different cir circumstances, um, where, where perhaps you want to like spend the rest of your life with that person. We think that when you actually consider what these what these scenarios can produce for the individual, you get far more beneficial uh, discourse in society and people thinking about this. In terms of like sexual awakening. We think it's a much better idea that people are able to experience this in a gentle way in, in, as part of the world around them, and not something that's distinct and separate, and something which should be to, taboo and kept in a dark room, because we haven't been told why it should be why it should be so a proposition. We don't see that there's any reason why it would. In fact, in fact, we think it's very harmful when you have to see this as an entirely separate part of your life. In terms of this false corporate state distinction, like they just assume that because you're the state, like you have better incentives or something like that. Like we point you to things like the Dove campaign for real beauty, ladies and gentlemen, a massive corporation which no thank you, which like Try to try to like, promote a different type of beauty. We think that that's absolutely laudable, and something which shows that this like, yeah. like idea about corporate incentives is like just rubbish. In terms of like people accessing their sexuality and why we think our side is uh, comparatively more advantageous, no thank you. We think that what this what this proposition does is it makes sex and sexuality and sexual orientation and gender taboo, right? We think that's massively problematic because it makes it, it makes it something that's distinct, a distinct and separate part of your being, which we say it's not. We say what it actually does is it impinges on your ability to ever embrace your sexuality. Like Christine gives you the point of information about things like new art actually empowering people to discuss different practices discuss how, what their sexuality means to them and how it engages with other, other aspects of their life. No, thank you. What this proposition does is it makes that discovery scary. It says that you have to go to places that you would never otherwise have to go in order to get this information, in order to discover your sexuality. It forces you into back alleys, to sex shops, with all the taboo that surrounds that in society when somebody sees you walking down that back alley and into that sex shop. When you go online, no thank you, in your basement and have to discover it this way. We say there's a number of things. Firstly, you do so alone in your basement. You, you, think that you're the, you think that you're the only person that ever has to undergo this, that doesn't understand it or automatically. You assume that everybody else doesn't face the same difficulties that you do. And we think that must be harmful to the individual. Secondly, you feel dirty. No, thank you. you see, if you see an ATN's movie which has like a storyline around it, which has a whole host of like real life scenarios in it, you can see that sexuality is part of that person's life. But when it's, solely, when it's something that's solely about sex, you see that, that something is dirty as to be kept in the bedroom. No, thank you. Thirdly, we say it disadvantages uh, lots of groups, particularly we, we're going to talk, focus on females for this bit of analysis. Firstly, because those, those are people who access porn less on average, and we think that's massively harmful to those people in terms of discovering their sexuality, because they're now places of disadvantage. Secondly, we say that in the massive majority of cases, porn does objectify women. This is just factually true, Mr. Speaker. 
here. And in terms of, like, and, and in terms of like, women never actually getting to choose to embrace their sexuality, you say that's problematic too. Because like, you now, in order to embrace your sexuality as a woman, you have to act like a porn star and not like Kira Knightley. You say that's massively, massively damaging. And I'll take opening in a moment. And um, finally, in terms of like where educational short, shortfall exists, you now, like we said, that people don't generally compensate by go, by going by going to by going to these like sites and shops, and we think that's massively massively harmful because you you basically lose this ability for people to be educated simply by being in a mainstream society. That's something that they never address. People who aren't otherwise educated get a kind of uh, organic education, if you will, simply from being in a, in a liberal society. So. If people were so able to rationally respond to this sexual imagery. Why were people so offended when the all comic hotch world put exotic female dancers on the stage and offended them with that display of intimacy? Um, well, I was going to school, firstly. And I think perhaps because people don't necessarily consent into things like that, that's fine. Because we think, no, because we think that you have things like watersheds under the status quo, you have like movie ratings, you can choose to watch an 18th movie or not, right? So we don't see how that stands. And um, moving into like this idea of positive discussion, we think that what, what happens here is like that you, that you don't ever, in a, like a feature of repressive society is that you don't ever get to talk about sex with other people. You don't ever get to discuss sexual practices or like the, or things that you might want, might, might want to talk about. So we think like what, what, this, what this leads to is a situation where dominant forces within society, therefore, such as the church, Get, get to dictate that discourse. Why is that harmful? Firstly, they have no mandate from the people. They're just people who happen to have organically risen to power, or because of like because like they happen to have more money, for example. But secondly, they get to push. They get to use like their social power, things things like things like you know like the, the, we have God on our side to make to dictate your views. We say that that's massively harmful to those individuals. For, for, furthermore, that hurts minorities because minorities obviously are the ones who don't control the majority discourse, Mr. Speaker. So that's massively harmful. You gave people an in countries where the Catholic Church is dominant, for example. So we think that's that's all very problematic. Um, and and like quite, finally, then this, this thing of like this idea like, like a public-private distinction which they paint, which we say is is ridiculous because they try to divorce what you consume in public from how you treat sex in private. We say you can't. They create a situation where when you're doing things in the bedroom, you're being a slut, and a public display of affection is something that's entirely divorced and separate from that. They never explain that distinction to you, speaker, because we believe that sex isn't divorced from love, isn't divorce from society because we believe that sexual expression can be a force for good in society and in public. We're proud to oppose. You're limiting the exposure of people to art. No, I don't, I don't 
get to go to every feminist art gallery just because I like trip over one on the street, right? They aren't that fun. <laughs> if I want to go to a feminist art gallery, I go to a feminist art gallery. And under our side of the house, we'd probably just put XXX in front of it and you'd go in anyway, right? Like, <laughs> still exists. Don't see an issue on their side. The next thing we tell you, though, is that the ways in which we get from first half is that it's important to put these kinds of images in the public sphere. But we think that the kinds of images that are put in the public sphere are not images that are beneficial to the people who are interacting with the public sphere. And what we tell you on this point is that the ways in which the images are portrayed is indeed the dominant narrative. And whether that means particular portrayals of how we understand female sexuality, or whether that means particular portrayals of sexuality, period, that is to say, normative sexuality, rather than what we might see as deviant sexuality, we still think that you're marginalizing groups at the expense of what are already the privileged majority within society. We don't think that's actually benefiting anybody other than the people who already have privilege. I'll take closing. Do you, do, you, do you just assert that all men and all companies are inherently misogynistic, or could we maybe be good ever? What you're misunderstanding is the fact that the patriarchy hurts men too. The patriarchy defines particular ways in which it's acceptable to be a man, it defines particular ways in which it's acceptable to be masculine, and if you don't happen to fall within those ways, then you aren't catered to either, right? Which means if you happen to be a skinny computer geek, we aren't selling ads to, about you as like, you know, some sort of like desirable sexual object. This hurts your self-esteem presumably as much as it hurts women. Okay. But we actually think it goes above and beyond in terms of the damage to women as a result of the fact that they are already perceived as particularly objectified within society. So what do we mean when we say objectify? What Jen tells you is that the important thing about objectification is that it removes any aspect of character, of autonomy, of individuality, of sense of self from the interactions that you have with other human beings. What it means is that you exist as a single image of you rather than exist as an entire comprehensive person. And we think that the ways in which you disentangle character and individuality from the ways in which you look is incredibly important. <coughs> If you see those things as connected, then you have a much higher likelihood of actually respecting the person that you're interacting with, and I'll take opening in a moment. What we think, however, is that if you see people as merely being sexual objects, that is to say, single images that you can consume passively, you don't have that same format of interaction that we get on our side of the house. Sure. We told you it was unsafe to assume that people are happy with their sexuality. What does your extension do for people who need public images to challenge and discover their real sexuality? We don't think that those people actually end up benefiting because the ways in which those images operate are still consistent with the dominant narrative, right? Which means that as a gay man, then you have to end up starting to accept particular notions of what it means to be a, su a successful man within society. We don't think that that's ultimately beneficial. What we also tell you, and I'll move on to my second point now, which is this analysis about the ways in which you form sexuality, is that sexuality ought to be formatted experientially. That we don't think that the ways in which you should format your sexuality within society should be that you get this sort of download of already existing images and dominant narratives that you would then feel obliged to try and reproduce within your own sexual relationships. And if you happen to be a guy who doesn't like whatever the trend in, you know, the ways in which we advertise right now look, then you just happen to be a guy who's somehow dysfunctional or broken. It's another way in which that harms men as well as women. No thanks, I've already taken two. Uh, so what we think ultimately then is that on our side of the house, we do force people <coughs> to format their sexuality and to form their sexuality through experience and through interaction. I, I already said I'm not taking more. I'm serious about that. Uh, so we, what, what you do instead is you end up interacting with other human beings, right? Instead of passively consuming the ways in which you understand sexuality and, being, and getting sort of like this onslaught of images that try and define for you and often do define for you the way in which you understand yourself and the way in which you want to interact with others. Instead, you experiment with other living people, which means that you get all kinds of creativity that just don't happen on their side of the house, right? If you aren't told that the only ways that you can experience sexual pleasure are through X, Y, and Z acts, and X, Y, and Z particular formats of your, or parts of your body, then we think that you have an incentive and indeed the, sort of, uh, the, indeed the possibility of understanding sex in entirely different ways. And what we think is tremendously important here is that ultimately means that sex is better. Keep in mind that we aren't saying on our side of the house that we're anti-sex, right? But what we are saying is that there are so many more creative ways in which we can understand sex that can then feed back into our understandings of ourselves that are so far <coughs> limited on their side of the house that people are discouraged from accessing them, and in the event that they even try, they're considered to be deviating from the norm. Which is why when Jen talks about, you know, one particular thing that she likes, which is actually really tame, everybody in this room laughs. If Jen had said she were a furry, we think that the room would have cracked up even harder, right? <laughs>
What we think is important, though, is that that is a legitimate sexual identity. And it's one that's marginalized within our society as a result of the fact that we only consider certain things to be legitimate sexual acts. We think that that gets reproduced through corporate narratives. We think that gets reproduced through the ways in which we produce images in movies. And we think that ultimately, it harms the ways in which we understand ourselves in relation to other people in society. We think that if you think sexual acts should be interactive and, and like tied to the ways in which you understand other people operating within society, you have no choice but to propose. Thank you very much for that speaker. Now to close out the space for us, I'd like to call on the opposition to work with you.
Secondly, they tell you that sexuality is intensely private and uncomfortable for everyone. We say that doesn't have to be the case, but it is the message that you send out under their proposition, that it should be the case, and that you should feel ashamed when you have basic human desires that they tell you predate advertising. They say, why is it that a cop people got offended by those dancers? Maybe it's that they were more similar to porn than they were to advertising. No, thank you. Maybe, though, it was the idea that not everyone opt in. That's their confusion, though. They tell you that people don't opt into this society, and you should, like, they introduce their proposition, because then people get to choose. You don't get to choose because you still don't have control over what other individuals around you consume. That is the same as the status quo, because you still don't think, you can, cannot understand what someone else is looking at in their back room, and you can't understand what sort of pornographic images they are interacting with. You can when you understand how the mainstream sees things, and you can move away from that. No thanks. Okay, selling love. Okay, we tell you that it is much more beneficial to actually sell things in a wider range of things. They tell you, for example, that you lose things like feminist art galleries, but who cares? We'll just put a big XXX over them. We tell you that that doesn't help those feminists, mostly because those sex shops are seen as a tool of the patriarchy and aren't something that these individuals want to go in and engage with for all the reasons they tell you. Then they tell you it doesn't help as many people, so we should get rid of them because it doesn't really matter. We tell you it does help a lot more, though, because of the changing narrative that it allows to be promoted under, that, under our opposition. We don't just sell hardcore sex on our side of the house. We sell all the shades in between, and it means you can engage with all the things in between. But before we go on, first up. Images, by their very nature, emphasize the physical and objective aspects of the subject, and corporations have every incentive to play to that sexual okay. nature or lose that their competition. How is cool. it a good set of incentives for alliance? Right, the problem is, right, that they, suggest, they think that it is a race to bottom to, to objectify women as much as possible to beat your competitor. No, the point is you want to be as tasteful as possible so as not to piss off half the people that will be buying your product. Oh, they tell you men's point. shoes do it. We say, no, that, no, that's not the case. You get campaigns against them because everyone in the public knows what you're talking about and so you engage with it and respond to it and stop it from happening. Secondly, like Nike makes oh, women's shoes point. too. They don't want to annoy their consumers either. Sexual discovery and why it's much better. Right. They tell you arousal is learnt. We say it's much better when it's learned with other people. Firstly, as Michael tells you, we get no response to any of this. We don't want you to discover it alone. We don't want you to feel ashamed about it. It happened in Ireland for like 50 or 100 years where no one could mention that anyone might fancy anyone else. And all it meant is that people felt way too ashamed to come forward and make frank discussion of what it meant to be a man or a woman or the things they want in their set of house, like what it should mean to be a man or a woman and be, and, and be, like, be powerful. Uh, secondly, you don't want it to be discussed only in private and in sketchy areas and not to be normalised because you never engage with it. Thirdly, you don't know what anyone else knows, you don't know what anyone else expects. They tell you that women have to be submissive under the proposition. We tell you when you expect that men are engaging in misogynist porn and you don't really know with it or engage with it because Michael tells you women are less likely to do so, you still have the same expectations but you are less willing to talk about them. Okay, public-private distinction. It forms a part of us, they all admit it. Michael tells you that it is something in hate to all people. But the problem is, the private discovery excludes that. It excludes discussion, it excludes any like, reinterpretation of what it should mean to be a woman or a man or be sexual. To discover that alone doesn't help that society. It will exist in the darker alleys where people feel ashamed. That doesn't help our discovery of ourselves, the world around us, or what it means to be a sexual being, so we oppose. Thank you very much everybody, that concludes the semi-final group. Please have a round of applause for all of our players.